Dawn breaks upon the waters, upon the mountains, in welcome, calling to me, the visitor, a sister from far, far away. The calling comes, the welcome comes, from the ancestors of Turtle Island. For this proud gathering to celebrate the power of the world's indigenous women. Kia ora koutou. I'd like to begin by thanking the Cody Institute to acknowledge those elders, the keepers of knowledge, the holders of wisdom who are present with us today. I would also like to acknowledge the institution which supports this brilliant program, Cody and Gord Cunningham, Nga Mihi Ki Aque, and of course Eileen Alma for her tireless efforts to keep me on track and get me here, and to Marie de Lorme, who actually had the idea. Thank you. Thank you all. But most of all, my greetings are to you, the alumni, the women who have made it through and then returned to your communities with so much treasure, with so much new wisdom, with so many insights to share. In my culture, we have a saying which goes, Kaore te kumara e kōrero mō tōna nei reka. The sweet potato never ever tells anyone how sweet she is. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> this is really hard to do because culturally we're brainwashed and programmed into never really talking about ourselves. And yet this afternoon, earlier today, I was amazed by the narratives that I heard and the pride with which those stories were shared. And no one was shy to celebrate her own success. That made me feel much more confident about what I'm going to say and share with you today. I was born in the 1940s and I grew up in a traditional village and part of my landscape was boiling mud and bubbling pools and geysers of hot water like this jetting up to the sky. That to me was a completely normal environment. And in that volcanic landscape, I was raised by a loving and extraordinary grandmother and a very special mother who actually adopted me at birth from other relatives, which is a common practice in the Māori community. But if I look at my eight biological grandparents, great-grandparents, my eight lines, Five are Māori, one, very strangely, is Norwegian Sami from the Arctic north of Tromsø. One is French and the other is German. So like many of you, I think I could qualify as Metsi. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I was adopted though and raised by a family of women weavers, storytellers, guides, and entertainers. And even though they were women of accomplishment and genius and outstanding creativity, I wanted more. I did. I wanted more. And I rebelled, I kicked hard, and I did my best to abolish the rules. 
However, what I'll do now is go through the outline of the presentation. It's quite hard when I can't see it. And so this will be the outline of my talk with you today. I've just introduced myself. I'm going to give some background on the Māori people of Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'll talk about ancient times, and then I'll talk about the 19th century and some of the things that happened there, and then move into the 20th. As I mentioned earlier, I was born in the 40s, which was kind of in the middle of it. And um, then consider the continuities from that time into today, and then I will conclude with a glimpse of the future and times to come. I wondered about including this slide because we have a Prince Harry follower in the room. The house that you see is my ceremonial long hall, Tamate Kapua, and on the plaza, the courtyard of that grand house, a year ago, we welcomed and looked after and fed and fussed over Harry and Megan. And this is the lineup from that day. If you look carefully, most of them are women. We're wearing our feathers, we're wearing our finery. Um, front row, I am a ceremonial practitioner in uh, Golden Feathers is myself and um, standing next to me are my cousins. It was an extraordinary day. It really, really was. But having said that, there are other things that need to be considered as well. And it's how on earth did I get here to end up talking with you. As Eileen mentioned, I did the PhD and the focus was cultural tourism, looking specifically at the visual and performing arts and their commercialization by Māori and also the role of women and how women were the principal entrepreneurs. I got the degree in 1981 I was the first female Māori native person to graduate with that degree from a New Zealand university. The real lesson though is that I couldn't get a job. Um, I did get to Oxford on a postdoctoral fellowship and ended up at the Pitt Rivers Museum where I became really, really intrigued and much more excited about ethnology and museum curatorship. And that kind of kick-started my career. What happened, though, is that once I got the postdoctoral qualifications, I went home, and at the time, in the city of Rotorua, which is um, where my village is located, the local museum needed a new curator. And it was actually a kind of beginning job. It wasn't a senior job. And I thought, I've got a PhD. I've been to Oxford. I've done the PRN courses. I know about museums. I applied for the job. My uncles rang me, two of them, and said, my dear, we have to talk with you. Kaore pai ana ki a mātou, mā te wāhine e whāwhā ngā taunga tapu. We consider it unseemly and inappropriate to have a woman handle our sacred objects. And we recommend that you withdraw your application, my dear, because actually we're part of the committee, actually. And um, the job's not for you. Well, that was crushing. <laughs> that was really devastating. And so what I did was I retreated 
with my doctorate and my qualifications and my fabulousness <laughs> and um, went fruit picking, cleaned motel rooms, um, when the seasons were out of kilter I lined up on the doll queue and no one believed I had a PhD, I had to take the certificates. Then I was offered a job as an assistant librarian <laughs> and I thought no way I'll stay on the doll. And um, another job came up in another city. And I'll just move on. Oh, more landscape. Another job came up. And it was at the Waikato Museum of Art and History in the lands of the Waikato Tainui people with whom I do have a kinship link. Their paramount chief, Dain Te Atairangi Kahu Te Ariki Nui, was a woman. And I thought, I might have a chance. Their chief is a female. <laughs> and we knew each other from when I was a young student, a rebellious activist, outrageous. Um, I didn't mention when I got my master's in English, I actually um, had a part-time job at a Catholic boys school, a college, teaching English. And I lost the job because we did this um, rather bizarre thing in women's liberation at that time and were photographed and filmed taking over the men's bar of um, one of the local hotels. This was 1971. And of course it was an outrage. How could we possibly do that? And I was kind of front and centre. <laughs> and when asked about you know, why I was doing that, um, I actually made a really brave, well mad, probably not really very sober statement about being, I didn't say the L word, I said the S word, being a sapphic woman at the vanguard of the movement. Um, that was Saturday night. Um, it came out in the Sunday papers. Monday, I got a telegram from Brother Magellan telling me my services were no longer required. <laughs> so that was sad. Anyway, I continued. And um, with Te Ata, with the Māori Queen, as she was known, I was appointed to the Waikato Museum of Art and History. And from that moment, my life began. My life as a professional, as a confident and articulate, and most of the time relatively sensible leader <laughs> began. Um, you may wonder about my face. The belief of my paramount chief in me, of Te Ata, Dain Te Ariki Nui, really uplifted my sense of confidence and my sense of worth. And for 24 years, I actually served her as a handbag holder, as an escort, as a funny kind of security guard, and um, as part of her circle. We lost her in 2006. We were all devastated. She was 75. She had been enthroned for 40 years exactly. And in the months approaching the first anniversary of her passing, which is a very important anniversary in the Māori world, the first anniversary. The tribe was wondering how to commemorate her, how to honour her memory. And of course all the men said, we'll make a monument, we'll have a new building, we'll do something really big. And her aunts and her sisters and her cousins gathered around and her one remaining maternal aunt, her mother's sister, 
said, No, we should take moko kauai. We should tattoo our faces to commemorate her, to honour her. And on that first day, that first anniversary, we will be there and she will know. So over a three-day weekend, two months before the anniversary, 16 of us had our faces inscribed to honour Te Arihinui. That's the story behind this. Continuing, <clears throat> she encouraged me in so many things, and she was in her own way a poet and a singer and a wordsmith. Over the last 15 years, these are the four books which I've produced. Um, three are, or two, no, two are non-fiction. Um, Maumoko is the definitive text on traditional Māori tattoo, and it's won a number of awards. Um, the one below it, E Ngā Uri Whakatupu, is um, a book accompanying an exhibition I did in 2015 on traditional Māori weaving, and particularly the work of Dame Rangi Māori Ehetet and her daughter, Digares Te Kanawa. And then the other two examples, Ruahine, and Tahuri are my own poetry and fiction collections. One, um, 2017, and the other, 2004. Speaking very briefly about Ruahine, because I think this is a story that many of us in the room will relate to, I was really fed up by the Victorian male vulgarising and bizarre interpretations and tellings of our stories, of our histories, of our legends, of what they considered fairy tales. And so I took eight that had been interfered with and I went to the places where supposedly these events had happened and I reclaimed the myths and rewrote the stories. So that's Ruahine. It was like a, an effective scholarly but creative intervention. But more importantly, I should talk with you about my people. In 1769, 250 years ago, Cook arrived and he counted kind of like 100,000 Māori. That was an estimate. Just as an aside to that, by 1890, there were 40,000. And then, at the last census, you can never keep a good native down, there were 4.5 New Zealanders, but of that number, 689,000 reported Māori descent. And that means that in the census forms, they can say they had a great-great-great-grandmother who may have been a princess of a particular tribe. Usually no tribe, but she was a princess. <laughs> so um, they report descent, but they don't identify. However, there are 598,000 of us who do identify, speak the language, walk the talk, live the life. And one of the things that I think strengthens us and makes us politically more effective is that we have one language. We have one language. On our lands, we have one, not hundreds. So we don't have quite the same challenge. Of those um, nearly 600,000 people, there are over 40 distinctive tribal groups spread throughout the three islands. And we were settled from central Polynesia. So um, there's the map. And please note, to your left, to the west, is Australia, 
which is a completely different country. Completely different. <laughs> Nothing to do with us. In 1840, a treaty was signed with Britain, the Treaty of Waitangi, and yet within two years, of course, it was shattered and the land wars began. The very last shot was fired in 1916 in my father's community of Maunga Pohatu, high in the ranges of Te Urewera. One of the other points, though, which is important as well, is that because we are islands, we have very clearly defined geographic borders, so there's no incursion from outside. We certainly fight within the islands about who owns what territory as individual tribes, but we don't have the same pressures and we don't have the same international conflicts that happen for so many of you. Talking about how the place is governed, we have a unicameral house, there are 120 seats, and women's suffrage occurred in 1893. For Māori, suffrage occurred in 1867. And at that time, we were actually allocated four seats in the house. Now we had seven. Yeah, great kind of proportional increase. So there are seven Māori seats. However, of course they're taken by Māori. In the general and mixed member proportional seats, the remaining 113, there are 20 plus, about 28 members of Māori descent. So it's quite a high proportion of, um, of Parliament. And currently, of course, we have wonderful Jacinta Ardern as our Prime Minister. And within her, within Parliament, there are 38 female members, women members, no transsexuals this time round. And um, 12 of those 38 women report Māori descent. Now that looks great, yeah. All of that looks really, really good. It does. Looks great. Not really. The treaty, as I mentioned, was shattered. We do have a tribunal process in which claims have been made, and many of the claims, particularly in the context of the land wars, have been settled. And they have been settled, in some instances, with enormous amounts of money and the return of usable ancestral land. But like our brothers and sisters here on this continent and across the Tasman Sea, Moana Orokawa, in Australia, we share the same issues. And here are some quite damning statistics. We had the highest suicide rate in the world, particularly for people under 25. We have an extraordinary level of incarceration when you think that actually we're about 19% of the total population and yet in the prisons, 58% of the residents in the female prisons are women of Māori descent. Um, in the men's prisons, the number is a little bit lower, which is of course interesting. 51 of the male prison population are Māori, 51%. We have 28% of the unemployed, we have massive homelessness, and of course, we die much, much younger than Pākehā, than non-Māori. So even though we are seen by our cousins around the world 
as having a relatively benign environment, actually it's not. It's not. But some of it is. So we share the same oppressions and we also share the same sense of resilience. And what makes that resilience? When I was growing up and being an absolute little shithead and um, <laughs> completely out of control but determined to do my own thing, I often listened to an aunt who was an extraordinary role model, played hockey till she was 68, mean game. This is um, field hockey, <laughs> not your hockey. <laughs> and um, she would always say to me, and now she's 96, we are never give up, girl, never give up. Whatever you want, you can do it, never give up. And I didn't. I'd always think of her, and she had this incredible face she still has with three teeth, <laughs> like three teeth, and um, one eye slightly kind of strange, falling, and she was always blinking, and um, great big shoulders because she worked as a laundress. She worked in the laundry, and she would wield a mean hockey stick, and um, she still enjoys a good pint before she goes to bed. <laughs> she was my favourite aunt. And from her, I learned the power of storytelling. Which brings me to Onehera, the time before. Much of our knowledge, and I think all of our power, comes from the understanding and the telling and the sharing of stories, particularly the old stories. And I thought at this point I'd share a few of my particularly special stories with you. On the screen, on the left hand side, is a carved panel from a meeting house, from a longhouse, and on the other screen is a painting by June Northcroft Grant. And if you look at those two images, you'll see something really quite strange going on, and you'll wonder, what on earth is happening there? In the, well, on the turtle's back, your trickster, apart from Raven, is Coyote. In the Māori world, our trickster is a dude called Maui. And you might remember in the film Moana, Maui was that gigantic, kind of super strange dude. Anyway, not a rugby player. In the story of Maui, here's the one that fished up most of the islands of the Pacific. He is a known Pacific entity. And having fished up all the islands and captured the sun so that people could weave and cultivate crops, he decided that he would vanquish death. He would challenge the goddess of death herself, Hidenui Tepo. Now, how she became the goddess of death is another story for another time. But to gain power over mortality and to ensure that humankind could live forever, he had to enter within her via her front passage, crawl right up through her body and capture her heart. And by doing that, he would claim immortality for all humankind. She was huge, she was massive, she was extraordinary. And in the shape of a lizard, he slithered up and made his approach. And it was so ridiculous that uh, one of our favorite birds is this little chatty, cheeky, delicate, diminutive 
Piwe Waka or Fantail. And they're very, very active and they never stop talking. They're constantly at it. And Tiwe Waka saw this obscenity, this mad vision of this little lizard attempting to penetrate and climb into and slide between the legs of the goddess of death. Well, of course, the birds all burst out laughing, and she sat up and closed her legs, and that was the end of Maui. <laughs> and that was the beginning of death for humankind. The next um, image is of Te Ao Kapurangi, and I'll be really fast here. She was an ancestor of mine, and an invading tribe were going to slaughter and wreak vengeance upon her village, which was on an island. And she was really, really distressed because she was married to the chief of the invading tribe. And she didn't want her family members on the island to perish. So she approached the head warrior general and said, Please spare my family. His answer to her was, okay, yep, okay, you've got a few hours. I'll give you till dawn. Whoever passes between your legs this night, I will save. What did she do? She climbed onto the roof of the highest house in the village, the largest house in the village. She spread them as wide as they would go and she called out to the people. And the house was filled and hundreds were saved. Now that's mana wahine. That is the power of women. That is a story that I always tell our granddaughters, our nieces, our little girls. Because we're told about the power there, but in so many different ways. This is a way that makes a lot of sense. And he was obliged to honour his promise. The final slide is um, of another heroic woman who would swim to the island and, or rather, swam to the island in the dark at midnight to her lover, to Tanekai. And by doing that, she contradicted the notion that women actually don't take any initiative. They do. Um, the poster that you see is actually my grandmother, and it comes from a 1914 full-length feature film, which was the first to be made in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in 1914, I said that. And um, her name was Hera Tafai, and there she is, Hine Moa. Continuing though, those are the old times. Now we come to the 19th century. We had a history of various encounters in the 1840s, People would come into the region, look at the volcanic activity, and think this would become one of the grandest spas in the English-speaking world. And it was developed so that by the um, 1870s, two hotels had been developed in my village, one called Mrs. Morrison's Family Hotel, she was a Māori woman, and the other, Mrs. Bennett's guest house, and she too was Māori. What were people coming to see? Apart from the geysers, and I showed you one earlier, they were also enthralled by the majesty of the pink and white terraces. And to guide and conduct people to the terraces, were a group of female guides. And um, up to your left again, our guide Kate, guide Sophia, who was in the middle, and guide Helen. 
and they ran a particularly brisk trade during those years. Because it was so successful, in 1880, Ngāti Whakauwe, the tribal group that owned most of the region, set up a township agreement with the Crown, and it was in its own way a minor treaty. The agreement included the donation of huge acreages for health and hospitals, for education and schools, for the churches, and also for public transport and amenities. It was going to be conducted as a leasehold arrangement between the Crown and the Māori owners. Disaster struck, 1886, a volcano erupted, half the district was wiped out. Those terraces disappeared from human gaze forever. The 1880 agreement inevitably collapsed. What did people do? They migrated to another thermal area and business resumed. And once again, the guides, the women, the entrepreneurs, the concert leaders, the entertainers, the creators of artworks and craft works, the owners of little shops and guest houses, females, most of them women, continued. And um, one of the principal sources of income was entertainment was the concert party or the cultural performing group um, with which my family has been involved since the 1860s. This particular party we see on the screen went to the Festival of Empire celebrations in 1910 and ended up doing a four-year tour of Britain at that time. The image, and I won't point them out, includes my grandfather, my grandmother, and my great-aunts. And one of them, Guide Maggie Papakura, who became Mrs. Margaret Staples Brown of Oxfordshire, <laughs> remained in Britain. She was the leader of the concert party and one of the most exalted and celebrated guides and entrepreneurs in the volcanic region. She was also an outstanding writer, thinker, intellectual change maker. She stayed in Britain, she enrolled at Oxford, she completed her thesis and three weeks before submission, at age 58, she died of cardiac arrest. So in many ways, it's a sad story for us, but her supervisor picked up the manuscript and published it as that book. That book inspired me. It told me that if one of my great aunts could do it, so could I. Her daughter-in-law, Rangitiaria, also became a very famous guide. And she was primarily the escort of royalty, had the most bizarre relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt, which kind of almost fringed on the scandalous, and um, was an incredibly charismatic and entrepreneurial woman who ran a number of um, concert parties and entertainment groups and inspired and trained a number of, a very high number of guides. And uh, to your left again um, is a view of the thermal reserve the volcanic valley through which she would escort visitors. Two of her cohort, contemporary guides, are also shown now. 
The one on the left is my favourite great aunt, um, Kitty Whitesingy, and the one on the right is my grandmother, some years after the Henemore poster. The feather cloak that she is wearing is the one that was in the Prince Harry slide I showed you earlier, and that was made by her grandmother. As well as um, guiding, they also made lots of small craft items like tiny baskets, uh, miniature poi balls, little bracelets. Uh, during Christmas, New Year, lots and lots of crepe paper lays. And they were canny and um, gifted businesswomen in their own way. But in the case of my grandmother, they were also weavers of outstanding talent. And um, she was chosen or approached in 1953 to make the cloak for Elizabeth II when she visited New Zealand. Um, that's now in the Royal Collections and it's one that I remember being made very, very vividly because two were made, we didn't know what size the Queen was and I got to keep the one that didn't fit her. I was really lucky. <laughs> the point of that story though is that my grandmother, even though I had two left hands and really couldn't weave, she had this astonishing, absolutely unrelenting sense of excellence. It had to be perfect. She would put, she would pick other people's work apart. She would sit there criticising. If it wasn't perfect, if even one tiny stitch was out of place, she'd unravel the garment. And my mother was the same. And it was that level of excellence and rigour they exemplified for me. And I'm so grateful for that. Even though personally I'm a hopeless weaver, but then everybody understood I was a whāngai, I was an adopted child, my bloodlines were different. And of course they were. My people, my ancestral lines, are singers, not weavers, are wordsmiths, not carvers, are philosophers and composers. We work in our heads, not with our hands. Anyway, continuing, I mentioned the crafts and I mentioned the small-scale entrepreneurship, but one particular element of commerce that was sustained even to today was the concert party. And um, the upper slide is 1925, the lower slide is 2005. So you see how nothing much changes. We're still doing it and we're still loving it. And what's important too is that we're making new, bright and exciting contemporary music and dance. Which brings us to now. Heroines, initiatives and the power of storytelling. Here are some of the initiatives with which some of you may be familiar the Māori Women's Development Incorporation, which I think Victoria is familiar with, began in 1990, government funded primarily as a way of introducing, encouraging and inspiring women to go, Māori women, to go into business. It was actually a development that initiated in the Māori Women's Welfare League. This organisation was crown funded and started in 1951 as a national organisation to combat the radical horrors and really intense demands of the Māori Women's Health League which had started in 1937 and was banging on about free milk for children in schools, free apples and fruit for children in schools, 
and the use of the Māori language as a teaching medium. This was 1937, and these old deals were really stroppy, so that by 1950 government had had enough and they set up their own organisation, massively funded and driven by the Crown, and that was the Māori Women's Wealthy League. The other uh, two symbols up there, speaking of language, are the Kōhanga Reo, which is the language nest movement, which began in the early 1980s by grandmothers. And it was understanding that our children were losing the language. 85% of us are urban dwellers now, away from the hokainga, away from the villages, away from the sites of ritual and customary practice. So the language was beginning to decline. Grandmothers hold the language and they began little language nests, which meant they would visit their grandchildren, their children in the cities and sit around together and speak the language, teach the songs, share the knowledge. And from those very small, non-funded, completely voluntary and extremely loving activities, the Kohanga Reo movement developed and is now triumphing in a way that we would never ever have anticipated. The language is safe. We can hear it again wherever we go. The last slide I'll speak to is um, Te Whakaruruho, Māori Women's Refuge. This began in the late 80s by a group of Māori women really concerned about domestic violence and sexual violence. It has since extended to include non-Māori and it is one of the most successful sites of intervention, re-education and healing for Māori in the country. So those are um, some of the issues and I've mentioned others in my deficit slide. At which point I'll introduce you to some of the heroines, people whose storytelling inspired me. In the arts particularly, Māori women have a really strong voice. Mirata Mita, who is a beloved friend and colleague of Alanis Obsanwin, I hope I said that properly, a native, a local native Canadian filmmaker, um, they worked together for many years. Merata, who died in 2010, produced a number of films, and the one on the left is a documentary produced by her son last year, and he's the little boy shown in the poster. The subtitle of the film is How Mum Decolonized the Screen and Merata was a truly inspirational storyteller and visionary, and her most famous quote is, if your film doesn't heal, there's no point in making it. The next person I'd like to share with you as a model of leadership and inspiration for me in my lifetime is another cousin. We're all from the same village. The glamorous and charismatic Miss New Zealand 1962, Maureen Waka, who later became Mrs. Maureen, no, Maureen Kenny, who later became Maureen Waka. She served on the local district council for 18 years. We lost her a few years ago and she was a major and effective and dynamic and relentless anti-gambling activist. What made her special is that she basically blocked the construction of a casino in our village region, in our tribal area, 
by influencing policy and by standing up to all the old men on the tribal councils who thought it would be a really good idea. She did it alone and the two licenses that were issued were given to Auckland and to Christchurch. Our township missed out and we are relieved. We are relieved and immensely grateful to Maureen. The final one that I'll share with you, wonderful charismatic woman, is um, my auntie, Auntie B, who had a, another persona who was Tina Tuna. <laughs> she was Tina Tuna until she was 75 years old. She wrote about 15 Māori language textbooks for children. She had her own show. She moonlighted as Tina Tuna and she didn't lip sync. She actually sang herself and was this extraordinary version of um, Tina. And then, alas, last year, we lost her. We lost her suddenly, unexpectedly, tragically. But she's still with us. We believe they never go away. We carry them in our hearts, and they continue to move by our side and through our lives. So I think now about Te Pai Tawhisi, the times to come. What stories do we pass on to the next generation? This afternoon, I heard some amazing stories from many of you. And I thought, yeah, tell your daughters, tell your nieces, tell your grandchildren. Keep the stories moving. Make more. Keep them going. Because it's this generation who will carry us into the future, who will carry our visions, who will carry our pain as well, but most of all, who will carry our stories as they make their own. As they make their own with joy and resilience and passion and courage. I heard that this afternoon and I am really grateful for it. We have a saying which is te kaya te rangatira he kōrero. The real food of leaders is talk, good talk, conversation, listening to each other. And that's what happened. And for that experience, I am truly, truly grateful. So I think of my own, <clears throat> and I finish with one of the nieces who was a weapons expert. Because Māori women were warriors. We were warriors. Why? Who else will defend the children? Who else will look after the little ones? Who else will take care of the generations yet to come? It's the women in us who do that. Nō reira, e rauranga tira mā, e te whānau, ngā mihi nui atu, ngā mihi nui, tēnā rā koutou katoa. Thank you.